Thank you for coming out to the 2017 Endowed Lectureship for the Janine Rainbolt College of Education. Uh, this is sponsored by or in conjunction with the uh, Women's Philanthropy Network at OU, as well as the student organization, the Adult and Higher Education Student Organization. My name is Derek Houston. I'm the visiting assistant, excuse me, not the visiting, actually I am the visiting, I'm the visiting assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma College of Education, Adult and Higher Education. Um, Tonight's speaker, as you, you all should know, is Dr. Sarah Goldie Robb. She is an award winning education expert and author of who's got the book? Who's got the book? Show it. Yes, that beautiful book. Author of Paying the Price College Costs, Financial Aid, and Betray Betrayal of the American Dream. It is an Amazon bestseller and has been featured on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, The New York Review of Books, and C-SPAN's Book TV, among other venues. Dr. Goldjik Robb is a professor of higher education policy and sociology at Temple University and founder of the Wisconsin Hope Lab, the nation's only translational research lab seeking ways to make college affordable. Without further ado, because she has more to say than I do, I introduce Dr. Sarah Goldjik Robb. I think that needs to come down here. Oh my goodness, look at all of you. Thank you so much for coming out on a weeknight to talk about college costs, which you'll quickly find is the most depressing topic that we could ever explore. I have to respond to, to Derek's introduction with a big thank you of my own. If you turn to the acknowledgments section of the book, you will find a little surprise that your visiting assistant professor is a man of many talents and he actually helped me with the book. Uh, did a beautiful job, especially with uh, some of the data, I believe, particularly in Chapter 2, as it turned out. Things move around a lot when you're writing a book, and uh, he helped make that happen. Also, it's great to be here tonight with my colleague, Elisa Hickel fryer who is a fellow William T. Grant Foundation uh, scholar, and we got to spend uh, several summertime trips together when I was early in the stages of writing this book, kind of bouncing ideas around. So... Lots of cool reasons to be here. Um, I should also mention it is my very first trip to Oklahoma. And when I was four years old, I was taken to see Oklahoma musical, the movie, on the big screen. So um, I have a soundtrack playing in my head right now that I will try not to let out as we go through things tonight. If I do, I apologize. Uh, I was a good student in school, but when it came to music, and particularly to singing, I always got a, a kind in needs improvement. So uh, anyway, all right, so I'm going to start tonight the way that I believe that all policymakers and all practitioners should when they want to make good and effective programs and policies to affect students, and that is to start with the students. I think far too often we proceed with planning our events for students or our classes or our resources or our policies with lots of ideas in our own minds and lots of goals, but often not enough information about the people we're actually trying to support, the students themselves. And that is, in fact, where this book begins, and that's where I'll start tonight. And I'm going to begin by talking a little about a woman named Chloe Johnson. And for those of you that read the book, you know that I first met Chloe when she was 18 years old, and it was the fall of 2008, and we were sitting across from each other at a public two-year college in Wisconsin. This was actually a technical college. Wisconsin has two types. They don't actually have a community college, but they have a technical college system, and they have a system of branch campuses associated with those universities. And Chloe and I were sitting across from one another in that little awkward pose that you do when you're first starting out as a researcher with a new person you're going to interview. And I knew that she was nervous, and I knew that she was wondering what it is I wanted to know from her. But all I really wanted to know, like we wanted to know from all the students in this study, was one simple thing. How's it going in college? You know, what matters in your life? And so where we really started with Chloe was just even more basic. What are you doing here, right? Why did you come to college in the first place? We didn't want to assume that we knew. We didn't want to assume from reading articles on the economic returns to college that everybody went there for the same exact reason. Although pretty quickly, Chloe began to talk us through that sort of reason. 
So she came from a small town a couple hours north of Madison, which is probably the city you're most well acquainted with in Wisconsin. Her tiny little town, though, didn't have as much going on, didn't have a state capital. It did have a papermaking mill, and that closed the year that she graduated from high school, which meant that a whole bunch of jobs went away. And so, as Chloe put it, she was in search of a decent life and a decent job to facilitate that life. She had grown up loving animals. She had a horse of her own. And so she decided that she wanted to become a veterinary technical assistant. You might wonder, why not just a vet? I had never even heard of a veterinary technical assistant until she told me about that job. And the reason that she wanted that job was because she was actually very modest about her abilities, and she was worried she wouldn't have it in her to make life or death decisions, which vets often have to do. So this young woman from this tiny little town goes off to the best veterinary technical assistant program available to her at a public college in the state and sits down to meet me and explains that that's, in fact, what she was there to do. She felt like, you know, you get out of high school and you go to college, you go there to get a decent job because, you know, let's be honest, there isn't anything else out there available to you. She kept mentioning this word decent, by the way. And I don't know if that's a common word around here about how people talk. But in Wisconsin, what they mean by decent is a little more than, you know, good enough, respectable. Chloe had had jobs before that she noted were okay jobs, jobs that involved working, say, at a place like Kohl's department store. But they weren't to her a decent job because they didn't pay well enough for her to have a decent life. So Chloe started us off in this study with, again, the economic, which wasn't all that surprising. But shortly after we met Chloe, we also met Nima. And Nima had a somewhat different rationale for wanting to go to college. She did want to make money, but unlike Chloe, she wasn't really talking about a decent life for herself. She was really talking about a decent life for the people who got her that far in her life to that point of being 18 years old and sitting there in college. The people who she left behind in Nepal when she and her family had what she called the best day of her life when they won the immigration lottery to be able to come to the United States. And so it was really important, it became really, really obvious as we talked to Nima about why and how she financed college to recognize that Nima's version of going to college was as much about her family of origin as it was about any particular future for herself. It wasn't about her own getting ahead. So Nima and Chloe were two of literally millions of people across the country who were working to pursue higher education in 2008. And before we go much further with those two students in Wisconsin, I want to zoom back for a second and think about what's really going on all over this country. We're in a really pretty incredible time. You know, it used to be that if you grew up in the United States and your family didn't have much money, you were lucky to be thinking about finishing high school. Thinking about going to college was maybe something you did occasionally when you were daydreaming, but it really wasn't something that you saw in your future. And that's particularly true, for example, if you grew up with, without a regular place to live or sufficient food on the table every night. Over time, we've done something, you know, fairly majestic. We've told people all over this country that if you don't have money and you want to go to college, we'll make it okay for you. We'll make you whole using financial aid. And so we have three and four ninth graders who not only aspire to college these days, but they actually expect to attend college. And those are different things, right? Hopes and expectations. There's a big gap between those usually because expectations reflect some information and some reality. So a whole lot more than even 75% hope to attend college, but a full three and four, even those from low-income families, expect to do so. And I actually want to suggest, while I'm going to spend a lot of time tearing on the financial aid system tonight, that that actually is partly because of the financial aid system. That has worked well in the sense that people kind of got their hopes and expectations up. But we have some serious problems, problems like these. 
So we know that we lose a lot of those ninth graders just between ninth grade and 12th grade, or even between the start of 12th grade and the end of senior year, people who don't make it to high school graduation. And whenever you hear somebody talk about the nation's historically high high school graduation rates, I want you to remember that there are still lots and lots of people who don't make it there. We have big gaps, even though we have high averages. But this is also true that even if we just take those people who do graduate from high school, who arguably make it through under-resourced school systems all over this country, and in that sense are pretty heroic, just one in two from low-income families will actually ever make the transition to college. And I mean any college. It doesn't have to be the big state public university. It doesn't even have to be one of those very respectable community colleges. We're counting you as enrolled even if you end up at a place like the University of Phoenix, a place you saw on TV, a place that told you if you went to college with them, you'd rise up. Okay, Only one in two makes it there. So we do have a college access problem. We've been spending a lot of time over the last decade talking about how the real problem is that people who go to college don't finish college. That is a real problem, and I'm going there in just a second. But that number needs to stick, and it needs to be discussed. Because while lots and lots of people from upper-income families, even as many as 9 in 10, go on to attend college if they're interested in college, just 1 in 2 do so if they're from low-income families. But arguably, the biggest crisis is this. Six years after entering college, if you're from a low-income family, you only have a 40% chance of having finished anything, an associate degree, a certificate, or a bachelor's degree. And that might not have been such a big deal. In fact, it wasn't such a big deal if you just backtrack to, say, the early 80s. Back then, people like economist Charles Mansky wrote about how college was the great experiment. It was your chance to go off in the world following high school and learn something about yourself. And maybe you'd find out it wasn't for you. Maybe you'd go and you'd say, hmm, I really can't take any more school. You know, I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. This isn't what I want to do. I'm going to go off in the world. Do something else. The problem with that notion of sort of a, a fun and even fanciful great experiment is that today, when only four in ten of these students are finishing college, Majority of those who don't are ending up in debt. And so the stakes have changed pretty dramatically. Now, a very typical story about what's going on here would lead some of us, including those of us who lean left, to say we're not spending enough money. Except that we are. We're spending a lot of money. Okay, $200 billion a year in federal and state financial aid is a lot of money. Okay, you can look at relative spending in different areas, and I think you would still conclude that's a sizable chunk of change. How is it possible that we can make these promises to people, that we can tell them we'll make them whole if they don't have money, that we'll make it possible for them to pay for college? How can we spend $200 billion a year and still get those graduation rates for low-income students. So smart people with PhDs and lots of other people who have their own hypotheses have been wondering about this for quite some time. And there's really been two main narratives. Um, the first narrative has to do with whether it's in fact money that matters. So one conclusion you can reach is if we're spending all that money and people still aren't graduating from college, well, what does that tell us? Maybe it's just really not about money. And so you've got this whole bunch of folks who are saying, well, we got to go back and look at the K-12 system, right? We got to talk about remediation, or maybe we got to talk about all these people who are going to college whose parents didn't go to college and how lost they get when they don't know how to navigate college, right? We can all have our favorite explanations that are not money related, so to speak. Another group of people are saying, well, it's definitely not financial aid because the money's there. And what that means is they're just not trying. And so we have this whole growth right now of this explanation about how, you know, pick your poison. Today's undergraduates are academically adrift, to put it in polite terms. Right? They're floating through school with professors not challenging them. Maybe they don't even want to graduate from college. Maybe they just came to party. 
Or maybe they just don't understand the value of a college education, and if we showed them more information about the returns they would get to college, they would buckle down and exert more effort. So we're wasting our money. In fact, we might even be coddling them with all this financial aid. And we've got these perspectives out there in the world. And when I started this study, I really didn't know what to make of those perspectives. I could suss through them sort of from a political standpoint, right, and think about some of those claims and how they related to claims that were made about other social programs, for example, about cash assistance for poor families and how they might resonate with other changes that we've made over time. But I really wasn't sure what to make, for example, of the claim that has come a lot from the left that maybe we've been mistaken in focusing so much on money because maybe this really isn't a problem of money. And, you know, researchers, we love to ask ourselves hard questions. So I kept asking myself what's going on, and I never really had a chance to explore it until one day I met a couple of extraordinarily wealthy people who were doing one of those great things that sometimes extraordinarily wealthy people can do, which is to create a scholarship program and decide to give some money away to help people finish college. And I had incredible luck of my own to be enlisted by them to not only support them in terms of figuring out how to run the program, but also getting the chance to study it. And in the book, I walk you through some of those details and the opportunities that it created. But what it really did for myself and my research team was to create the chance to partner up with 3,000 students from low-income families all over the state of Wisconsin and work with them to help us figure out this puzzle. What was really going to happen to all these folks was that some of them were going to get from these wealthy folks some additional money for college. And some of them weren't. And that's the way life works, right? Sometimes you fill out that FAFSA. Has anybody ever done that thing? Small American bureaucratic tragedy. You should get a gold star and a whole pile of cash, but you don't. You usually get the equivalent of pennies compared to what you need. But these folks did it, and some of them got extra money. Okay. And we were able to follow them over time as they tried to go through college and collect a whole heap of data on the, their lives to try to figure out these questions. So for those who thought that, you know, maybe college students don't finish college because they don't try hard enough, we were able to actually collect some direct data on things like their effort, right? How hard did they try? How much did they study? How much did they party? How much did they spend on booze and cigarettes? We asked them all sorts of these questions. We also asked them questions about the other things that might be going on in their lives that somebody might not think were so money related, right, but might still be playing a role. Things like who provides emotional support to you while you're in college? Oh, and by the way, do you feel obligated to support your family financially when you're in school? How many hours a night do you sleep? How often do you eat? Do you have a safe and secure place to live? We asked them on the first survey more than 100 questions. I violated all norms of good survey work. I did it on paper. Crazy, right, in 2008. But I had a hunch that if we wrote questions that mattered to them, we introduced it to them as a form of activism, meaning please do our survey because we want to understand financial aid and help make it count that they would join us, and they did. 75% of them responded to that first survey. And many of them started writing in the margins comments like, thank you for asking. We're glad somebody cares. Oh, and by the way, there was $5 cash in the envelope and 20 bucks if they did the survey. Just a trick for the researchers in the room. Heaps of cash also work. Okay. The other thing that we asked of them was to take it a step further and to get a little more personal. So we wanted to look at their transcripts, and we wanted to look at their financial aid data. And I know the privacy experts in the room are already going, you did what? Yes, but I can't understand your financial aid if I can't actually see your financial aid, because trust me, you don't really know what's in your financial aid package most of the time. And that is not your fault. That is the fault of all the people who built a system that is so difficult to maneuver that it takes a PhD and sometimes more to even figure out what it says. We wanted to know what it actually meant to students. We wanted to know what was going to come up for them while they went through college and tell the stories that they don't ever hear told because they're never asked. And so we invited them 
to sit down with us for interviews. Now, a thousand of those students, most of whom were working, most of whom had families to support in some way or another, despite being 18 years old, a thousand of them took us up on it. We didn't have the resources to talk to a thousand people, and I really wish we had. We had the resources to talk to 50, but to not just speak to them once, to speak to them over and over again over the course of six years, going back whether or not they were in school to find out what their lives were like. So when I talk about people like Chloe and Nima and when I walk you through their lives in the book, please know these are not people we found on a street corner, right? And these are not people with the saddest stories we ever heard. These people are representative of the thousand people who said that they would do interviews. And also these people were chosen to show in this book precisely because they were actually not uncommon. I don't display the saddest stories and I won't tell you the saddest ones tonight because we don't make good public policy off of either the best or the worst stories. So I wanna take you through a little bit about what they taught us. The first thing they taught us shouldn't surprise anybody, but it seems to especially surprise Washington, which is that financial aid just doesn't pay. Okay, and anybody who's filled out the FAFSA tends to know that. The Pell Grant recipient in this country is supposed to be the one kind of college student who literally doesn't have to worry about money. Okay, the Pell Grant program was created in the mid-1960s by a senator from Rhode Island who believed the way lots of people do today, that one's own family income should not determine their chances of obtaining a college degree. It's a very American way of thinking about things. What it says is that it will be your hard work and your effort that will determine your chances of success rather than the place you were born into. Okay? And with that in mind, what the Pell Grant was supposed to do was cover 100% of the cost of attending college if you went to a public institution. All you had to do was go to a public two-year or four-year university, and it was supposed to be covered. So let's look at the numbers. And this is so important because I think a lot of people, especially families who are not Pell recipients, who are just above that line maybe, right? Those families who say, I am too rich to get financial aid, but too poor to afford college. They often have this vision in their minds that if only they were poorer, they would get a substantial amount more help. So let's look at what this thing really looks like. All right. I'm going to just see if this little... I don't have a little light on there, do I? Okay. Well, that's okay. So I want you to first take a look at the uh, blue line. The blue line is what this Pell Grant program costs annually in terms of expenditures. And here I'm only going back to the mid-90s and tracing that forward in constant dollars. And what you probably got your eyes on is that nice big spike. Okay. That's what D.C. policymakers also have their eyes on. That's the point at which this program went from a $20 billion a year program to almost a $40 billion a year program. And as you can probably tell from the bottom axis, it happened because of the Great Recession. This is pretty straightforward. If you build a program that's supposed to help low-income people and then the economy tanks so there are more low-income people, then the cost of the program, if it's what we call an entitlement program, which is what the Pell is, the cost should go up. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. There were more people who qualified for the Pell Grant. That's the orange line. And so the number of Pell recipients went up. This should have been a sign that this program was doing its job. Instead, it became a sign and a symbol of massive failure of American undergraduates and particularly of Pell recipients. All of a sudden, those statistics like the ones I showed you earlier about the number of people who don't graduate from college, who are from lower income families, all of a sudden these were splashed across every newspaper in Washington. All of a sudden, we started to hear about this new, interesting group of people that they called Pell runners. Pell runners are a fascinating breed who, in need of perhaps $4,000 or $5,000, decide that it would be a good idea to apply to college and fill out the FAFSA to get that money. And once they got it, to take it and run away. I could think of easier ways. There are a lot of easier ways to make money than to try to cheat the federal financial aid system 
And despite the number of media calls searching for Pell runners to talk to, which were reminiscent of the calls in the 1980s where Ronald Reagan was searching for a welfare recipient who had a limousine, where she was hiding all of the children in the back while she had a good night out on the town on the cash assistance she was receiving, they didn't find her and we didn't find the Pell runners. In fact, there's a lower rate of cheating in this program than in almost any other social program out there. But that's what that spike inspired. Now, contrast that with what you can see at the bottom, which are very evident flat lines. Those lines represent change over time in the average and maximum amounts of the Pell Grant during that entire time. In other words, while more people needed the program, they didn't actually get more money from the program on a year-by-year -year basis, which would have been fine if the price of college during that time stayed the same. How many of you think the price of college during that time stayed the same? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> Reality-based um, audience. I like that. All right. So translate, since it obviously went up, and I really don't need to take time to show you the line that just goes straight up. What happened is what we call in fancy wonky terms the declining purchasing power of the Pell Grant, a.k.a. the thing doesn't have much value anymore. The thing that was supposed to cover 100% of the cost of attending college in the two-year or four-year sector, which only ever did in the community college sector and only for a limited period of time, rapidly lost its power as the total amount of the grant tended to stay about the same while the price of college continued to rise. Right? And in the public sector, the main reason that the price of college continued to rise is that while the federal government kept its deal in putting in money for higher ed, states, as more people went to college, started to diminish the amount of money they would put in. So that so-called compact, to the extent that there ever really was one, and I argue in the book, I'm really not sure it ever was one. I think it was more like the feds said, we're going to do this, and the state said, hmm. And then a few of them did it, and then most of them backed off. We get this. And this chart is not new. I have been seeing this chart ever since I started becoming a scholar. This is a pretty famous depiction of the problem. What I want to tell you now is what this actually feels like on a human scale. So how many of you have ever used a Groupon? OK, lots. Good. It reached Oklahoma. All right. <laughs> It's like saying, have you heard of Amazon? All right. So, so the Groupon is pretty cute. It's really just an electronic coupon, of course, but it's managed to make it feel extra special because you can use your fancy phone and swipe through things. And what you're looking for is an experience that you would like to have for some reason, but you normally wouldn't engage in because it costs you too much money. And if we discount that for you, well, suddenly you're interested. Okay, whether or not the real price it shows you is actually a real discount, it makes you feel like you had a discount. And so let's say that one day you were flipping through that Groupon and all of a sudden you saw a Groupon for that restaurant in town that you've always wanted to go to, right? Maybe it's got an amazing steak. The prices are way too high for you and your partner. You're not going to be going there anytime soon, but you've heard that the really fancy people in town go there and you'd like to try it. So you're psyched because you find a 70% off Groupon. Terrific. You buy it. You and your partner make a date, go to the restaurant, Waiter comes by, drops off the menus, you look at the prices, you're kind of freaking out. The prices are way beyond anything you would normally ever do, but you're getting 70% off, so you relax. And you order, and you get your food, and you take a bite, and it's good. It's exactly what you hoped it would be. And the two of you are looking around, and maybe you order a bottle of wine, something you would never normally do, but you always wanted to try. This is what people have been talking about. And you're enjoying yourselves, and you're eating your meal, and you're three quarters of the way done. And then that waiter walks by again. And he looks at you and says, just, I want to just check. By the way, I, I really hope you're not using that Groupon, are you? And you're like, why? And he said, well, there was a typo. Really, sorry, I'm sure it's going to be fine for you because I'm sure you've got a credit card or something, but it's only 30% off. Okay, well, you had a problem, right? You already ate dinner. You can't give it back. You had the experience, right? Just as he's finishing telling you about this, you were just finishing your meal. What are you going to do? Well, like so many Americans, no, I'm sorry, you do not have a credit card in your wallet, and there is no extra cash. 
The only reason you came is because you were told this was the price you were going to get. But you also have no money to go hire an attorney to do anything about this problem. So what are you going to do? You're going to go in the back and offer to wash dishes to work it off? Well, they already got two guys in the back. They're underpaying to do that work. So you can't do it. What are you going to do? You're going to dine and dash? But you're going to feel horrible. And besides, that's not who you are. You have a very serious problem. You don't have anything to give back. Okay? This is exactly the situation these students are finding themselves in all the time. It's not that they aren't enjoying college. It's not that they haven't had a taste. The price they are being given is not the price they expected. And it wasn't even as easy to read as 70% or 30%. And it, by the way, it's a whole lot more important than a dinner. What those students take away from that experience is not just a sense of consumer dissatisfaction. Frankly, it borderlines on a sense of rage. It is a sense of betrayal. It is a sense of confusion. It is a sense that they might have done something wrong. And it is especially challenging to them because, again, they were not indulging in a nice night out. They were getting the education that everybody everywhere tells them is the way to get ahead. So that's sort of problem number one, and I want to drive it home with some numbers. Ian Williams was a student in Milwaukee the year that, again, the study started, 2008, and Ian Williams did what virtually, I'd say, 90% of students around this country do if they're from low-income families. He went to the public university near his home, right? Nice public university, close by, on the bus line, okay? He filed his FAFSA. It was not easy to do because his mom was not all that interested in giving up the information. She had a bunch of kids, and she wasn't making much money, and frankly, she couldn't see the point of filling out this thing just to prove that she didn't have money. But she did fill it out, and he received this official term, expected family contribution, the federal government's judgment as to what he could afford of 450 bucks, 425 bucks, okay? So not that huge. It felt like something to Ian's family, but it wasn't insurmountable. It certainly wasn't what happened to Chloe Johnson, whose mom made $25,000 a year, and she was told that her expected family contribution was $2,520, because Chloe's mom didn't have more kids. Okay, 2,520 bucks does not feel doable to a mom making $25,000, and she was not able to pay it. Ian's mom came up with the $425. Chloe sold her horse. That expected family contribution can be a very big deal. But even though Ian could pay the $425, he was going to be a long way short of what it cost for a year at that public institution. In 2008, it was over $17,000 a year. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's not just tuition. And you're right, because tuition is less than half of the cost of attending college. Every student knows this. Okay? It's tuition fees, housing and food, transportation and medical, and books and supplies. Oh, and all this little thing called personal expenses, which some people like to trivialize because, let's be honest, we're talking about clothes. But if any of you in here couldn't afford clothing, or to do your laundry, trust me, you wouldn't be staying in the room for very long. And this is actually a real problem that colleges in some parts of the country are facing. People who haven't bathed in several days or people who can't afford to do laundry. The personal expense allowance is not very big, but it matters to people who have no money. So if this system were working properly, let's do the math. Ian Williams should have received $17,633 minus $425, and he should have received all of that in grant aid because that guy is a Pell recipient. Instead, he got just over seven. The $7,000 is a nearly maximum level Pell grant and the state of Wisconsin's equivalent of the Pell grant, which actually really isn't the equivalent because it is, number one, very small, and number two, unlike the Pell, it is not an entitlement. And what that means is that as more people need it, the amount of money usually stays the same. So that just means more people get left out in the cold. And that was the story of Ian Williams. So in his first year, he gets the $7,000. In his second year, he gets just about five. Because the second year of college, even though he filed the FAFSA the same time he did his first year, by that point, the Wisconsin grant had already run out. 
Okay. As more people go to college, the waiting list for financial aid at the state level tends to get longer. That's all that tends to happen. So what is a guy supposed to do from a family making $25,000 a year with a bunch of siblings when you're given a price that is clearly way too big? He's $10,000 short. He saw absolutely no way to come up with that other than to turn to loans. Okay, unless you think he can completely cover that with loans, remember that the maximum federal available loans for a student like him, 18 years old, in his first year of college is $5,500. And that actually hasn't changed much over time. It's a funny thing to think about in this day and age, but it's actually kind of weird that as college has gotten more expensive, we have not made the loans available any bigger. He's actually left short. The only thing he could do to come up with more loans was A, to have his mom take what's called the parent plus loan. But there you'd be ignoring the realities of so many African-American families like his, whose, fa whose fortunes have been ruined by devastations to their credit. His mother would never have qualified for a parent plus loan, and particularly in the midst of the recession. The only other thing he could have done was get a private loan if anybody would make it to him or his family, which they definitely did not. So he could turn to credit cards, or he could turn to work, or he could just turn to hope. Okay, There wasn't much option for this guy. There's another problem, of course. And again, the students know this, and it has taken so many of us so long to catch up. And that is that all those numbers I just gave you, they are fake. There's really no kind way to put it. They are official statistics. And like we're told in school, official statistics often lie. They're not trying to lie. They are trying to estimate your ability to pay for college. They're just doing a really bad job of it. They're trying to estimate what it actually costs to run a college for a year for a student, and they're just doing a really bad job of it. But the fact is, most times, that number is a gross underestimate of what it will really cost. If, I'm, if push comes to shove, and a place like Money Magazine is asking me to tell a middle-class family how much more it will actually cost their kid to go to college than what they're being told, I tell them to estimate another $10,000 a year. And my gut check with most parents is that's about right, especially for middle-class kids who come up against things like, you got to buy the sheets that fit the special bed, right, so you can live in the residence hall. There's so many additional hidden costs. The health care costs of the thing that isn't covered, the thing that you happen to need in that first year. So there's all kinds of stuff. Like I said, the need analysis is all kinds of wrong, right? One way the need analysis is wrong is something a lot of people don't know much about, which is that the, it bottoms out at zero. And it makes sense because the expected family contribution to college, by definition, a contribution couldn't be less than zero, right? Zero is the least you could contribute, except that the needs analysis that, all that, that uses all that data that you give out on the FAFSA can actually lead to a negative number. And the way to think about that is what that should be is the needed government contribution to the family to offset the fact that when a student goes to college, they are often unable to contribute financially backing the family, something they've been doing in high school. Right? The reality for so many families these days is they are counting on their kids long before they are college graduates, and that need does not disappear. However, the number actually does exist. We just erase it. You could get a negative $9,000, and we erase it and replace it with a zero, thereby somehow magically erasing the experience of being a young man like Ian, whose mom actually needs his money, including his financial aid. But he's not going to have it to give, because the aid office is going to pretend like that need doesn't even exist. Let's talk for a second about one of my favorite topics, living expenses. Is anybody having especially an easy time of paying rent these days or mortgage? Okay, right. Everybody across this country knows that it's expensive to live in this country. And yet we spend all this time in higher ed talking about tuition like it's the only thing going on. Okay. 87%, 87% of all college students in the United States do not live in residence halls. They live, quote, off campus. In other words, in the real world. 50% of all college students live with their families. By federal law, every college creates three numbers. Two if you don't have campus housing. One number 
is the number of actually living in your residence halls. And arguably, colleges and universities should know something about that since they set the price. You should be able to accurately state it. Number two is a number if you live off campus but not with your family. Number three is the number if you live off campus with your family. Have you ever asked yourself how the colleges come up with those other two numbers, given that they don't control rents, nor do they set the price of food that isn't served in their cafeterias? We don't know how they come up with it, except that they can, by law, do basically whatever they want as long as they tell people what they did. So they can survey students. That seems like a decent thing to do, except that what if all your students are flat out broke and are doubled up and tripled up living with each other to make ends meet, and it's not any good for anybody, but that seems to be what it costs to live. You could call some landlords. You could read the ads in the paper. Okay, You can do a whole bunch of different things. What we've discovered is that that leeway tends to result in colleges in the exact same area reporting very different costs of living. I could show you a map of Washington, D.C. with widely disparate estimates. Show you the same thing probably around here. You don't have as many colleges. It wouldn't be as interesting to look at. Okay? However, it might be interesting if I showed you what the for-profit colleges estimate it costs to live because there's been this really interesting trend over time. Would you know that according to the for-profit colleges and universities, it has become less expensive to live in the United States over the last several years? Would you know that according to the new school, a prominent private school in New York City, it has become less expensive to live in New York City over the last five years, right? As the pressure to look affordable has increased, instead of lowering tuition, people have simply diminished the living costs. When that conflicts with reality, a student saying, no, I can't live on that, what usually happens is not a second guessing of the estimated living cost, but a second guessing of the student. This is where you get the conversation. Hmm, maybe what we need to do is offer you some financial counseling so you can learn to live within your means. Okay? One in four college students in the United States has a child. 13% of college students in the United States are single parents. They are living within their means. And telling them that they should be doubling up or tripling up or even worse is to put people in really untenable situations, okay? It isn't the case for the most part that the low-income people are the ones having trouble living within their means. And I can tell you that from having stared at their budget logs over time. There is no room in these things, and they are very meticulously thought through. But they are facing incorrect official statistics. Of course, if some of these low-income students were to follow the golden rule that's increasingly out there in educational policy and attend the most elite college they could possibly get themselves into, there will be additional hidden costs, the hidden costs of actually participating in college life. All right, so here's what students do when they can't make ends meet. Okay, this is just a sample from the very first year of college of what we saw. These things tend to line up with national numbers. Basically, we see students taking loans. That is no surprise, including for students at two-year schools. We see very few students getting any work-study funding. The story of that program, a very nice program, but a very badly allocated and underfunded program, is also told in the book. I wish we did better by work-study, but we don't. And what we really see are students working. But when they say that they're working, they are often not just working one job or even two. They are working at night. Okay, they're working graveyard shifts because they pay more at those times. And when they're not working, it isn't because they don't want to. It's often because they can't find work. And that's something we have not been talking about with today's undergraduates, that they are just like most other lower-skilled workers who simply can't find what they need. When they need help, very few of them can turn to friends or family for support. And so this became the study in which we first really learned that not only did falling short in college mean you didn't have a laptop or enough books for class, but you didn't have enough to eat and sometimes enough place or secure place to sleep. Okay. We can talk more about this in Q&A, but I've done extensive research with my team on food and housing insecurity now over the last eight years. And in two weeks, we'll be putting out the biggest study ever done on this that involved 33,000 students. And I can tell you that these numbers 
are a much rosier picture than what's really going on across the country. So we tracked these folks, and lo and behold, their outcomes looked very much like the national averages. Wisconsin really isn't different. In fact, I've been taking to saying that we all live in Wisconsin now, as depressing as that might be. <laughs> they ended up in debt and no degree, okay? Trying to repay loans that you got during your first year of college when all you got was a couple of credits and nothing to go with it is extremely difficult. That's the real debt crisis that we should be talking about. It's not six figures of debt that you got from going to law school where you chose a school that was out of your range and you probably shouldn't have paid for it. I'm sorry. I really wish we could fix it for you, but the people who are starving because of student loans, the people who are defaulting on their loans, they're defaulting on about $5,000, which is a huge number to them because they are high school graduates with nothing else. And as I said before, what they're taking away is a whole lot of anger. And I think it's worth noting that that anger is not just directed at higher education. It is directed at the government. And then when they say government, they mean all kinds of government. Anybody and everybody who ever made them a promise or told them that a program would help them has now become something that they fear and at worst hate. So I don't think we have any choice but to do better than this. And I don't think we can spend another 50 years tinkering with this system. I think this system is broken in so many ways that it frankly is not salvageable. If you'd like to work on salvaging it, however, in chapter 10 of the book, there are a bunch of technocratic fixes, small things we could do in the meantime. Things like, could we just change the language of expected family contribution instead of being so presumptuous and just call it estimated? Okay? We could do a little less harm to a whole lot of people and do it pretty quickly. But we can do more than that. And places like this could do it tomorrow. The first thing we could do is while we spend a lot of time testing students, figuring out if they can make it at our school, we could also, not on the admission side, but after admissions, start assessing whether they are ready to learn. Readiness to learn, Maslow teaches us, has as much to do with having your basic needs secured as anything else. Checking on our fellow human beings just to make sure that they aren't bordering on homelessness is a humane thing to do, and it's a strategic thing to do for colleges and universities. If you can do a little triage and help somebody have a tough situation, you can retain them in college and get them through to that degree so they don't become another statistic on your cohort default rate. We need to help faculty and, st and staff who are encountering students all the time who are going through these challenges and have no training to help them know what to do. Mainly what they do is dip into their pockets. They bring in peanut butter sandwiches. They hand out cliff bars. These are good band-aids, but they need to know that there's more. We could be doing things, for example, like screening you for the Pell Grant might also come with screening you for food stamps. Okay, The SNAP program, may it survive this year, is an entitlement program. And it doesn't cost the state of Oklahoma much money at all to allow people to get food stamps so they can finish their college degree and never need those food stamps again. We can address those living costs. We can get the numbers right. There's no reason for financial aid offices all over this country to be estimating the living costs when those numbers are reported in every county in this country and we can provide them with the data. One less thing to do. We can also use a whole array of programs that already exist. Programs like food banks, which are now operating things like food scholarships food pantries on campuses, housing voucher programs directed at college students to try to meet some of these needs. We could provide emergency aid. Financial aid is way too slow. Chloe Johnson took on too many jobs. She found that it was hurting her grades. It was not surprising. When she decided she should take a loan in order to not have to work as much, it took a month and a half for that money to arrive. By that point, Chloe had become a dropout. Emergency aid can be 200 bucks. 200 bucks delivered when and how it's needed by a trusted support person can mean a whole lot to a student. It can reconnect them to the school and meet their financial needs so that they can stay enrolled. We can also do much more to keep, help keep, people keep the money they fought so hard to get in the first place. I mean, there is this crazy thing called refiling your FAFSA every single year, even though nothing has changed and you're in the same school. Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia has created legislation called the File Once FAFSA for students at four-year schools. It'd be great to see something like that passed. It would also be great to see the financial aid recipients cut the slack that the children of other 
parents who can pay for college get cut when they get bad grades in their first year. Lots of us struggle when we make a transition in education, whether it's from middle school to high school or from high school to college, the first year can be hard. But for financial aid recipients, hard can mean not only bad grades, but the loss of your aid, which effectively pushes you right out the door. It's counterproductive. The good news is that the federal government gives schools the flexibility to not do that to first year students. You're allowed to not do that. And yet virtually every school in the country still does. We can also do a lot more just tweaks with our language, how we talk to people. Like I said before, expected could become estimated. We could actually let students know that we recognize that college can often be unaffordable. It's not our fault. It's not the fault of the University of Oklahoma that the place costs so darn much. It has much more to do with state funding. So why not work with the students to destigmatize those economic challenges? And let them know that you're there to support them whenever and however you can, even if it's not with money. We found time and again that the hardest part of not having money is feeling shame. Students who are placed in contexts where there are other students who are also working, who also don't have money, actually tend to fare better because it's normalized. And so that's another thing to consider doing. Of course, we should do a lot more to make work pay. I've got lots of recommendations on the work study program and the fight for 15 would go a long way in helping undergraduates complete college. Okay. In this new report we have coming out soon, and one quick preview I can tell you is that one of the big characteristics of homeless undergraduates, the big defining thing that separates them from people who are not homeless, is not that they're better in school or anything else, it's that they get paid at least $15 an hour, those other students. Homeless students are working, working long hours, and never make that 15 And I hope that one's clear. Okay, this system is complicated primarily because it's trying to ration money. It's trying to target money to the lowest income people with the idea that they will be well off, that they'll be made whole. But the system is broken and poor because it's targeted to those people. This country has a long history of creating complexity and bureaucracy and underfunding programs that are directed at the most vulnerable Americans. When programs are supported by the middle class where everybody has something at stake, they tend to be far more democratic and they tend to be far harder to cut. And I think those political dynamics and those social dynamics are one of the most interesting reasons and perhaps the most promising reasons to actually lower the price of college in this way rather than through this aid system. In the book, I describe a randomized experiment in which we did give people more grant aid, as I described earlier. So I have a direct test of how much better they would do if they just got more money through the regular system. And the answer is not much. Because all the same rules apply. And those rules are cutting the legs off of those funds. Finally, I think I, along with many other people, recognize that it is hard to spend time doing policy and practice sometimes when you got students right in front of you with real need. I believe in emergency aid. I'm working on testing the efficacy of it. And in the meantime, my friends and I decided to simply go all in, take a chunk of our income, and fund an emergency fund. What this fund is doing is rather than giving money to administrators who tend to create committees that take two weeks to decide when to give out an emergency fund because they don't know what an emergency is, we give the money to teachers. I don't mean to slight the administrators. It's just how it goes. The teachers know what an emergency looks like. So we're giving them the grants, it goes in their pockets, and they hand it out as they see fit to students. All they got to do is write me a line that promises it didn't go to their kids. Right? It goes to their students, and right now it's going out across Boston, Milwaukee, and Madison. Next year we'll pick three more places and continue to give it out. The point there is just to show that real people can do real things, and we don't have to wait around all the time for Washington to do something. Along those same lines, the book proceeds are going to more research in this area to find better solutions. And uh, at this point, having hopefully delivered at least a little bit of hope towards the end there, I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, we have time Good. for Q&A. Excellent. And we have a microphone that you should speak into because we're recording it to be viewed later. So I guess I'll walk around and pass out a microphone. Well, 
Thank you for being here, and thank you for all your hard work. There was one thing I wanted to share with you, and that is that if a student goes to the Department of Human Services here in Norman and says that they're in college, they're ineligible yeah. for food stamps mm -hmm. or SNAP benefits. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that you're aware of yeah. that policy. So um, are they... Are they ineligible entirely, or are they ineligible unless they work 20 hours a week? Um, if I'm not, I, I mean, I haven't looked at the policy in a long okay. time, but I'm pretty sure entirely. It's entirely? Okay. So we should double check, but federal law says that that undergraduates are eligible, but again, with some very serious conditions on it. If it is an undergraduate with a child under federal law, you can receive food stamps if you have got kids. Like I said, that helps one in four undergraduates. And the biggest problem there is they don't know that they're eligible for food stamps. So the biggest thing we have to do for those folks is let them know. The second thing is that if you do not have children, you have to work at least 20 hours a week. And those rules apply to everybody, regardless of whether or not you're an undergraduate. Okay. The problem with that, of course, is that working 20 hours a week is not that conducive to doing very well in college. And that in theory, anyway, college is work. So college should count towards the work requirement not only for food stamps, but also for cash assistance. And this was a change that was also made when we shifted from aid to families with dependent children to temporary aid for needy families, welfare. Okay, But there is supposed to be another out for college students, and that is this. You're not supposed to be subjected to the 20-hour week work requirement if you're receiving work-study money. Now, the problem with that is that the people who made that clause did not seem to know that our work-study program is so underfunded that only one in 10 low-income students attending public colleges and universities gets any work-study funding, even though they're all eligible for it, right? So what it needs to say is if you're work-study eligible, you don't have to do the requirement, but that isn't what it says. So unless state law has decided to be more severe than the federal law, which I hadn't actually heard much about. I've actually tended to see states like Massachusetts have, well, y'all are the complete opposite of Massachusetts. I know, I just came from there, so I apologize. But you know, what they're doing in Massachusetts is they're letting the college count towards the work requirement, which is pretty great. Um, it's possible that it's completely outlawed. I would love for y'all to know for sure, and I would also wanna make sure that if it isn't allowed, you should do some. You should at least register concern about that because there really is the interesting thing about this movement around food and housing insecurity among college students is that there is a moral component to it. And some people, even those who don't believe in more support for other low income people, are finding that group to be sympathetic and they're having some real trouble with the idea that we're sending people to school and they haven't eaten. So, I believe that yeah. one of the things that was stated was with the university here in Norman. There's just no way that we could, we could. That it would be you all that. in particular. Yeah. They would have problems with. Yeah, I mean, there have been all kinds of crazy things. You know, sometimes it happened with housing. Tom Harkin did something, right? I mean, Iowan liberal Tom Harkin made some big mistake where he ended up making it harder for low income students to get housing when they're in college because he was worried that there were some athletes who were double dipping at the University of Iowa, right? And so he got something into federal law that really messed that all up for a whole bunch of other people. And this is kind of my point, right? We have too many people, even well-meaning people, even people we might otherwise politically agree with, who are making poor policy decisions because they don't really understand the reality of what they're doing. In some cases, it's a moralizing or a judgment of other kinds. I think in a lot of cases, they just don't know the empirical reality. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, so in this room, we have a lot of graduate students, uh, master's students, doctoral students, and some undergraduates who are interested in doing research. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what we still don't know. If you had a group of people who you could kind of dedicate yeah. their time to <laughs> trying to help us understand more about what's going on here, what would you advise them to do? That's a great question. I mean, frankly, there's still a lot we don't know. I mean, I just pick a topic like this underemployment problem, right? We, we do want to figure out how to make work pay for college students. And the overall movement, for example, for Fight for 15 is one thing. But what are some good practices of employers partnering with colleges in their communities to be supportive of undergraduates so they'll complete degrees and come work for you? Right? What does that look like? 
We'd love to know more about that. We'd love to know what kinds of work, if you had to work in college, what kinds of work work well with being a student? I mean, apart from the obvious, the kind that lets you do your schoolwork while you're at work, right? I mean, these are the kind, you know, we want to know that stuff. Um, there is this big, there's sort of a, there's sort of a little bit of a mystery around while there are social programs, especially in other states that are available to help people, right? Housing support programs, food support programs, et cetera. Why don't more students take them up? Why is it that if there is a community food pantry available to you, an undergraduate still won't go there, but will go to the campus one? Is it really stigma? Is it convenience? Like, what is it? And what could we do to market those things better so that when we do make them, people will come? Uh, we need to know a lot more about states and their behaviors. I mean, we know something, and you know people who are working on this stuff, right? But how do we bring states back to the, if they were ever at the table? I don't even want to pretend like they were. Some of them never were at the table. But what is it going to take to rebuild or to build in the first place a constituency for public higher education that does have broader appeal? I mean, I've thought a million times, this term liberal education, I spoke at the AACNU and all I wanted to say was, can we take the word liberal out of it? Because people just think you're making liberals. I mean, it's true, right? So what are, and we know a lot about advertising and marketing, right? This is why, by the way, free is brilliant. We need to stop saying that free college isn't really free. There isn't anybody in reality who doesn't know that. It's free just like the streets are free and the libraries are free and K-12 is free, right? Those things, we don't have to say the word free library, although some libraries call themselves a free library because they're worried people won't come in because they think they have to pay something. But free has magic to it. What are the other magic words? What are the other words that will get people to re-engage in a system they don't trust? Here's another, I'll give you one more. Um, you know, so when, when people drop out of high school, we have dropout recovery programs that go get them and bring them back in. They're not always successful, but a lot of them are. We don't have those in college. We have dropouts all over this country. Right? We don't like to call them that. We coddle ourselves and we say, you know, let's be kind to ourselves. That they, they don't really dislike us. Maybe they're coming back. No, I've met them. They're really mad. Okay? So repatriation, as one way to think about it, is a very serious concern. And it needs to be dealt with probably with um, organizations, perhaps community-based organizations, that do not involve the college calling you, do not involve the debt collector calling you. Right? The, the student loan debt folks, they're wondering why you don't want to know where they are. I mean, you know, like you're not answering your phone. Well, you're not going to answer the phone when the college calls either. So who is it that can get in the middle of all that and bring people back to the table to finish their degrees? Because the best thing you can do to help somebody who's struggling to repay their debt is to have them finish their degree. That is the best preventative. But you shouldn't do it at another, again, high price. So those should be some ideas for you. So when you're talking about Free public college. Mm -hmm. So just a quick clarification. Do you yep. mean tuition free or do you mean last dollar assistance? Oh, this, wow, that's a very technical question. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Let's put these things on a spectrum. Okay. There is an ideal type. There is an ideal policy, right? What things would look like if wishes were fishes. Okay. And then there's now. In policy development, there's always a process. We're on, we're on the path, okay? So last dollar, we can come out swinging. Last dollar says go apply for all the financial aid you can get, and if there's a gap left between what you get and your tuition and fees that you're being charged, we'll make up the difference. And some people are arguing that's really regressive, okay? Because people who get a bigger Pell Grant have less to make up of that gap, and people who get a smaller Pell Grant or no Pell Grant have a bigger gap, right? And so we're getting in this argument over whether that's actually a good thing to be doing. I have two problems with that. One is, I think we all know that that line for the Pell isn't in the right place to begin with, and there are lots of people with need who aren't getting Pell. And the second is there's a whole lot of people who would get a full Pell if only they came to college, and they're not coming because they don't believe you. And they're coming under last dollar programs. Okay, so even Tennessee, which was created by a Republican governor and everybody said it's regressive, et cetera, I think we're going to see progressive effects. Okay, I am talking about the full shebang, and I've written a, a proposal that um, essentially makes the first degree free. And the progressive part of it is it's targeted at the first degree, which is the associate degree. 
I argue that everybody should be given the associate degree, even on their way to a bachelor's degree. Because sometimes life gets in the way, and anybody who's pursued a PhD knows it's good to take the master's. <laughs> okay? We should be giving it out. And all this warfare between two-year and four-year colleges over who gets to give the, the associate degree, that's about schools, not students. And that's not okay. So we make the associate degree free soup to nuts because during that associate degree, you are learning how to do college. Right? You are learning how to do the 13th and 14th year. And once you've learned that, right, then maybe you can make some reasonable decisions about whether you are going to take a loan and stuff like that. I'd like to start there and then move towards the bachelor's. But I'm talking tuition fees, and I'm talking about a full-on stipend for room and board and all that kind of stuff. And so yep. my question regarding this is, what role does the federal government play? Mm -hmm. What role does the state government yep. play? Where is this implemented? Where is this ideally implemented? Yep, it is ideally implemented with federal role because we need to repurpose the Pell to pay for it, at least under the scheme that I cracked up, right? So there's so much money in the Pell Grant along with other forms of aid that I don't see how we continue to do that while doing this, right? It, ex with one exception, if we would say tomorrow that all federal dollars for financial aid would only go to the public sector, then we could pay for this tomorrow, okay? You got so much money going to the private sector all the stuff that we don't tolerate in K-12 education, or we have historically not tolerated, <laughs> goes on in higher ed. And it goes on because Harvard wants it that way, and Stanford wants it that way. And so, by the way, do a whole bunch of tuition-dependent private institutions, and so, by the way, does DeVry and Capella, right? And the University of Phoenix that has a bigger advertising budget than Coca-Cola. If you cut them off, if we had a revolution, where people said, we're not doing that anymore because we can't hold you accountable. And we cut you off and said, you can exist. We're just not going to give you taxpayer support in this manner. We could pay for two years of college free for everybody in the United States in the public sector tomorrow. So it can be, a, it can be the whole compact thing. We can do a, the state role. I mean, and the way I fashioned it was let the feds take care of the tuition, let the states take care of the books and supplies, let the institution and the state split the living costs. You know, and putting them on the hook partly for keeping those living costs down because they're more localized costs, right? But we can come up with all sorts of things until we grapple with, number one, the big hard question of whether this is a public good that we can all afford to support together by putting in a few pennies together or by cutting off the private colleges, right? And two, we figure out whether we're going to prioritize affordability or choice. And those are the two things competing with each other. How many choices do you want to give each other of colleges to attend? Or how affordable do you want college to be? Once we grapple with those two things, then we're on our way. So very simple. It'll be over by next week. <laughs> Especially under the current regime. <laughs> you can tell him I said so. Uh, real quick, just curious. My sense is that higher education is about to be assaulted by everybody connected with ALEC, and that there is an enormous effort that's just started that's going to go after higher education. Mm -hmm. There was a bill introduced in Iowa to mm -hmm. get uh, faculty candidates for jobs to identify their political parties. Yes. And there's other, there's crazy stuff going on with tuition in Iowa, Missouri, already in Wisconsin. Um, am I a paranoid? Am I crazy? Am I a conspiracy theorist? Or is this going to happen? No, you understand the political economy of education. Al but the only thing you got wrong is it's not about to. It's been going on for years, right? I am. I spent 12 years in Wisconsin. That's already happened. It's already happened in North Carolina, right? So we've had a longstanding, um, and let's, let's frame it in a different way. I mean, right, like there are legitimate disagreements policy disagreements over how to do things, right? One way of thinking about this is there shouldn't be public money going to what they view as a private good. And everybody who talks about making more money off college is contributing to that rhetoric, okay? And that's how you get the loan rhetoric too, because if you're gonna make so much more bank off of being in college, then you might as well take a loan for it. And we all don't need to care. That's the attitude, right? So the assault on the funding has been going on for 20 years. Then the, the thing is then that's coupled with this assault on quality, right? And all the things that we hold dear, like good teaching from a stable workforce that isn't completely tearing their hair out, 
over threats to their very content of their classes. I mean, I think the scariest stuff, frankly, is like the Wisconsin legislators who are telling people what they can and can't teach. Literally, you can't have that book. You can't have the course name that way. What are you doing over there? Talking about somebody's rights, right? That stuff is the creep into what is education in the first place. But it has been going on, and absolutely it's coordinated. And we know this, by the way, because the bills all look the same. I mean, there's a copy and pasting that's happening here, right? It isn't that we suddenly have a bunch of incredibly innovative governors, right? They all were in a room together at a conference, and somebody gave them a cookie cutter, and they chopped stuff up, and now they're all doing it. And they're doing it in places first where people are least likely to be able to resist. Wisconsin and North Carolina are two places where people are deeply place-bound, community-driven, right? They don't want to leave. And you can erode their working conditions, and you can diminish their pay, and you can threaten their livelihoods, and they don't have a whole lot of choice. And so they've taken it, right? I mean, I left Wisconsin, but I left behind 99% of people who stayed, right? And that's the hardest part, because they're just going to endure. And by the way, they're going to do the best job they possibly can with less and less and less, which is the story of public higher ed. I think there was one more. Two more? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, how you doing? Um, first of all, was uh, Trevor Noah one of the coolest people you ever met? <laughs> you know, I love him. You know, I, I loved him, and I, I didn't, you know what I tell you? I underestimated him when I was speaking with him, right, initially, because I thought of him as a comedian. Mm -hmm. He's so much more than a comedian. Number one, I was terrified when I was doing that. That was the single most stressful experience, other than childbirth, that I have ever been through. And he was kind. The second thing is his book is amazing. And if you want a good read, read Born a Crime, and you will learn more about South Africa and apartheid than you ever knew from a personal perspective. So, yes, thank you for the thank question. You. Go well, ahead. What's your real one? Here's my real question. Um, I did a little, you know, studying, and I find that universities are spending billions of dollars on improving campuses. Mm. Um, and that comes at a cost mm -hmm. of... Uh, increasing tuition for students. Mm -hmm. And like uh, High Point University in North Carolina has a um, a first lounge airplane. Yes. You know, yes. a first class airplane lounge. Yes. Like to study in. Like right. that's not going to help me for the real world. No. You know, it seems like we're putting luxury over education. Yes. Do you see that to be the case? Okay. Well, the answer is sort of. And that's because this. First, 50% of all college students, for the most part, are in places like community colleges. And there are no lazy rivers in community colleges. There are no such fancy amenities in community colleges. And no, they're not building Westons for people to stay in, right? So the fact that the price has gone up so much in the community college and all these students are coming out in debt has nothing to do with those amenities, okay? Then there's the public sector, right? Another huge, uh, the public four-year sector. There are some schools where those things are happening. The question is partly why they're happening. For those schools, they're mainly trying to keep up with the Joneses. And the reason for that is they're trying to compete for students. And they're trying to compete not for the in-state students anymore, but for the out-of-state and international students who, frankly, are demanding those things. The reason they're doing that is because they're under economic pressure. The other reason they're doing that is because there are a bunch of private schools that some of whom because of economics and some of whom simply because of prestige have decided to provide their students with the most top flight experience. And that also creates competitive pressure, right? So I was at Amherst last week. This tour that I am on does not normally go to places like Amherst because frankly, mm -mm, that is not my place. But I was invited and I wanted to go see what it's all about because I've heard about the 1%, although I never had been in a place like that. And during my talk, I started to talk a little bit in the Q&A about how much do we resource people in college, right? So how do we know how much it should cost for your education, right? Like, what does it take to take a first-generation college student all the way from first year to graduation? I said, hardly anybody knows. But there was a man looking at me in the back of the room, and guess who he was? He was the CFO, and he knew. So he came up to me after. And do you know what Amherst spends? Amherst being the number one school in the nation, supposedly, for low-income students, which enrolls 442 Pell recipients out of the 1,650 on campus, they spend 
$1,000 per year for their students. I don't think we can have a conversation about the amenities race in higher ed still, until we start talking about the fact that they also get millions of dollars in taxpayer subsidies. Well, they spend that kind of money on people who've already been judged to be among the smartest in the country. The contrast is that there's really no way that most public institutions are spending more than about twelve to $15,000 per student. And they are taking whoever they can get. So I think we're being distracted, to be honest with you, right? I think you're right. You can find those examples. Can you trace a line between those things and the really big increases that are really affecting most people? No. And are we using those things to drive a political conversation where we basically blame the 99% of colleges that don't have money for the behaviors of that 1%? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So uh, this morning, we started my class by watching you on Trevor Noah. And, um, and the, students, uh, the students were kind of like, you know, Dr. Cullen? Um, yeah, we know this because we live it. Yeah. And what I was curious was is that since there are a lot of undergrads in the room as well, I was wondering if maybe you could just give them a little bit of advice about how they can make sure that people at this university understand what their experiences are. Because I have to say, I read your book and there were some things that I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Or I hadn't thought about that. And it's not, it's not like um, ignorance in the, like I want to be ignorant. It's ignorance like I really don't know. No, And great. so I was just wondering if you might give some of our students some tips of ways that they could help educate and help make this part of the discussion. Thank you, that's a great, thank you. Um, First, I do want to say that has been the big reaction I've gotten from students, and that's the most affirming thing for a researcher, right? What you don't want is to put stuff out there and have people go, I don't know anybody like that. That's not my experience, and I'm not having that experience at all, frankly, which is telling me something, and it's telling me something that feels good as a researcher and feels horrible as a person, right? To find so many people who are having so much trouble. I'm also finding a lot of faculty who felt like I did. I mean, I'm sure you read where... I had a student fall asleep in my classroom and I started to blame her and then I blamed me and I didn't understand what was happening and then I found out she was working the graveyard shift. And then, frankly, my world shifted a bit. You know, it, it's hard to tell the people who are suffering the most that it is their job to educate us. I have a really hard time doing that. I can also tell you, though, that while your stories don't make public policy in and of themselves, and especially individually, together, they do form a basis for changing the conversation. And so I have been urging people who've been through horrible things to tell their stories, and those who've been through less horrible things to just be more vocal in their daily lives about what this is like. Because the faculty don't know, and the staff don't know, and the administrators don't know until you explain it to them. And so, you know, if you missed a test because you had a shift at work that you were gonna lose your job over, then you should go tell them. And if they tell you that you should have been in school and lost the job, then you say, how should I pay for it? You know, do it politely, but tell them. And it's only gonna help, it's only gonna be better when a lot of people do it, frankly. Then it's gonna be more like, it isn't just you, right? C. Wright Mills, the famous sociologist said, you know, there are personal troubles, there are private issues, and then there are political challenges. And this is a political challenge. This is no individual's fault. Right? That's the hardest thing. Nobody did anything wrong here. No individual person did anything wrong by not being able to pay for college. You did nothing wrong by coming to school. I've seen those online commenters who suggest that this homeless student should have known better and worked in McDonald's until he was ready to come to college. What reality are you living in? Right? You're in college because you're trying to climb your way out of something. So talk about it. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's the biggest thing. And the more you talk about it and the more you let people know and you speak up in venues and whatever chance you get, and maybe you have a, a student organization or a food, you got a food pantry here. Support your food pantry. I don't just mean by donating. Support those students by talking about the fact that you have a food pantry. And what does it mean that you have a food pantry now? Along with 450 other schools that also have food pantries. Normalize this because it's happening everywhere. But don't normalize it to the point that you don't try to change it. All right. Thank you all so much for your time.